All right, I have uh, started to stream the lecture to have it recorded, so I'm going to start it now. Um, let's go back to the announcement that I made over the weekend. I made a few over the weekend for this class. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to work on the keep warm exercise that I mentioned in class, I mean, in the uh, uh, in the announcement. So it's a basically a t uh, binary addition, 101 in base 2 plus 011 in base 2. And we're going to use the structure that we have been talking about, you know, about multi-digit addition. But this time we're going to use the rules for base 2 addition. So we're going to start with that, and then we're going to transition to um, carry look ahead you know, mechanism. In other words, you know, we'll look into how to re remove the linear dependency of, you know, this carry depends on that carry, that carry in return depends on that carry, and so on. All right, so are there any questions before we start? <clears throat> no questions? All right. Excellent. So we're still missing about one-third of the class or so, but I'm not going to wait, so we're going to go start now. All right, so it's 101 plus 011, and eventually I figure out, you know, how to get all of this stuff here to work, and I'm going to close a window that I don't need anymore, just so that it doesn't cause any confusion on my side. And let's see, there we go. All right, so for this, I'm going to use my tablet um, just because it's easier for me to you know, write this out you know, freehand instead of um, you know, using uh, Joplin to do this. So let me recall the addition. I think it's 101 plus 011. Is that correct? OK. All right, so let's go ahead and we have 101 in base 2 plus 011 in base 2. All right, so we have the x row, y. So these two are basically the inputs. Those are the numbers that we are given with, in this case, in base two, that we're trying to add. <clears throat> and then we have the Q row here, and then we have the K row here, and then we have the sum row, which is the last one. So I'm just leaving a lot of blanks for now, because the first thing we want to do is to figure out, okay, so how do we do this in general, okay, in base 10 or in any other base? So we talked about how the Q's are defined, right? The Q's are the R of X and Y, okay? So that's one thing that we should probably know by now is, you know, how Q of I is defined. So we know Q of I is the R of X, I, Y, I. And, you know, I hope you guys know where that is coming from because you have been studying or at least reviewing, you know, the lectures because, you know, if people are, if anyone is asking, you know, in their mind, you know, where that's coming from, I think that person has a little bit of catching up to do. Okay, I really hate to put it that way, but that really is the case. So from here, we also want to look at how R is defined. R was defined in a certain way for just, you know, general any base. So we defined one for base 10 already. And then we transition to base two. And we found out that R in base two can also be done using logic gates. Okay, specifically, it is called exclusive OR, or if we choose not to use exclusive OR, you can also re-express it using logical NOT, logical AND, as well as logical OR. So that's kind of what we figure out. All right, so we'll go ahead and figure out you know, the Q row first. So the Q row is simply the exclusive OR between the X and the Y. So we have a zero here, we have a one here, and then we have another one over here. And somehow that one did not show up. Oh, okay, that show up. All right, so now the next question is, what about the K row? The K row turns out to be the more troublesome one. Um, but at this point, okay, right now, at this point, we can assume K0 to be zero, okay? Because, you know, unless we have a chained addition, we can just go ahead and say, yeah, we can just kind of assume this one is a zero, making things a little bit easier. But we do have to figure out what is K1. So 
So when you look back into the equations, we, we know that Ki plus 1, so if you look at Ki plus 1, it is the C of Xi, Yi, or the C of uh, Qi, Ki. Okay, so once again, you know, if that particular definition or if that equation looks you know, foreign to anyone, that person has a little bit of catching up to do because that is what we have talked about last Thursday. I know because I checked my own recording this morning. <laughs> I suggest that you guys, if you have the chance to do it, like, you know, early in the morning, you know, just kind of check what we talked about the prior class. That will bring your mind you know, up to speed in terms of the context of what we'll be talking about today. So we also worked on the C function in general, which is, which is whatever the arguments are, you know, add them together. If they're greater than or equal to the base, we turn to one, otherwise we turn to zero. But we also found that in phase two, we can do, uh, we can perform the same operations using a logical and, and that has to do with the truth table that we worked on last Thursday. So as a result, we can now take a look at this and I'm going to use some color coding here, you know, just so that you know, we can see, you know, where the uh, result is coming from. So we can see that, you know, this one plus one or one and one is a one. So that automatically contributes a ones over here. And then we look at these two one plus one. And that contributes a one over here. And then once again, we look at these two one plus one or you know, C of one one, and we end up with another one over here. So now we can look at the sum bits. The sum bits are defined like this. The sum i, the sum bit of bit, sum of bit i, as you say, the sum bit i is the R between the QI and the KI, meaning they're just exclusive ORs. So now we look at the exclusive exclusive or between the two ones. Okay, let me let me try. Uh, th that may not work too well, but I'll, I'll give it a try. So these two, when you look at the exclusive OR, it is a zero. When you look at these two, it's also a zero here. When you look at these two, it is also a zero here. So we have a zero here because it's the exclusive OR between zero and zero. We have another zero here because that's also an exclusive OR between a one and a one, which is a zero. And then we have another exclusive OR between one and one, and that's also a zero. So that concludes the example that I gave you guys over the weekend. I hope some of you had a chance to work on that example using these definitions. And so you're basically um, helping yourself to establish the connection between all the things that we have talked about so far. Um, but that's basically how we perform binary addition. All right, so do we have any questions? after a really hot and long weekend. <laughs> no questions. All right. Well, <clears throat> if there are no questions, um, I can give you an idea of what the first exam may include. Um, <laughs> typically, I would ask questions about your binary addition, except it is not giving you the x and the y and then having you to figure out what is the q, the k, and what is sum. It's giving you some random bits, okay? So we just sprinkle some zeros and ones in a very minimal fashion, and it will ask you to backfill all of the other bits. So you're gonna have to use all the definitions and reasoning to basically figure out what other, you know, what zeros and ones should, should fill up all the other places. I call that Sudoku for binary addition. So if you enjoy the game of you know, uh, Sudoku, you'll, you'll be familiar with the techniques, okay? You know, even though you know, we're using different rules, in this case, okay, I can give you guys some uh, practice, you know, uh, sessions or practice questions, you know, after we talk about some of the other bits, you know, but at this point, um, we just want to be able to relate all the terms. Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> all right. So if this is out of the way, then we can continue with our discussion. I did change my notes a little bit, so for those of you who like to have a print out, you, know, you might want to go print it out again, because I made some change, changes to section six. 
So let me uh, give you an idea of what changes I made. I added this little sentence here in parentheses. Note that these are all Boolean expressions because every single semester, somebody is going to ask me, what is the exclamation point doing here? What is a plus? Are we really adding? No, this is an or. Uh, are we really multiplying xi and yi? No, that is a conjunction. So it is important to understand that at this point, because we're dealing with binary addition, all of these operations are now logical operations. The notation of using plus to mean uh, disjunction and using what looks like multiplication to mean conjunction is in the note itself, okay? It is just not probably at a very prominent place, but it is there. All right, so if you, so I really hope you guys had a chance to read the module carefully, sentence by sentence, and pick out all the definitions and all the notations, you know, that I, that I have included in this particular module. All right, so given that is the case, we're going to go through some derivation. And the other change I made in this document is I basically provided a little bit of explanation you know, next to each line. So this way it is easier for us to figure out you know, why we have the result after each line. And for whatever strange reason, that projector, was it ever on or it, never, it was never on before? Never on? Let me see if I can turn it back on. Alright, so this is going to be more plate projector 2, more plate 2 on. Oh. Yep. It looks like it's going to turn on itself now. All right, so we're going to go through these rows one by one, just so that you have an idea of, you know, how it is derived. K of I plus 1 equals to C of XIYI or C of QIKI. I think we just saw this earlier, right? Okay, so this should not be a mystery at all. And then from here to here has to do with how the C function works for binary numbers. So we change your C of XI, YI to CI, XI, and YI. And we also know how QI is defined. QI is the exclusive or, or the R of XI, YI, and that's why you know, I put down here as the definition of Q. And then the definition of R allows us to expand R of XI, YI to XI not YI or not XI, YI. That is another way to express exclusive OR. And then from here to here, it is uh, distribution. So as it turns out, distribution works exactly the same from, you, know, um, you can borrow that concept from general algebra to Boolean algebra. Except in Boolean algebra, distribution works the other way around, which is kind of weird, but this is the usual distribution where you have a, a sum um, distributed over another term. <clears throat> and then from here to here, it is identity. In other words, this one looks just like identity in multiplication. Anything times one is anything. Okay, it looks just like that, and it works kind of the same way in Boolean algebra, except this one is actually and true. Okay, anything and true is that original anything. And then from here to here, this one does not exist in normal algebra. It is basically saying true or whatever is true. Does that make sense to you? True or whatever is true. And if it seems to make sense to you, how do you prove it? What is the easiest way to prove true or whatever is true? Can someone give me an idea? What is my favorite tool? Yes. The truth table. The truth table. Yes. Very good. Okay. So we are going to give it a try just so that we are you know, kind of getting really familiar with truth table. So we have x here, which is an independent variable, and then we have one or true over here. As an independent variable, x can only be false or true. True or false is true. True or true is also true. There we go. So regardless of what x is, which is our independent variable here, true or whatever that thing is, is always true. You cannot turn true back into false if you keep boring it with something else. All right? So that's our proof. And then when we get back to our explanation here, that's why I mentioned here true or x is just true. And that allows me to 
change the one here, which is identity for conjunction, into one or, or true or another term, which is ki. It doesn't really matter whether it's ki or not, but ki is useful later on, so that's why I or that with ki. And then from here to here, it is distribution again, but I also make you made use of identity. So X, I, Y, I, and one is just simplified to X, I, Y, I. X, I, Y, I, and K, I becomes its own term here. So that's what I said. That's why I said it is identity and distribution. And then from here to here, this is also something that you do not see in normal algebra, but in Boolean algebra, X or true, X, excuse me, X or X is always just X. So once again, you know, I'm not going to do it this time, but you can use a truth table to verify for yourself that, you know, X or X is just X itself. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. <clears throat> so I'm teaching you a little bit of Boolean algebra along the way. And then from here to here, it is commutative. In other words, I moved the terms around a little bit. Nope, um, nope, that is wrong. Actually, this is not commutative. It should have said, you know, associative. So can someone remind me what is associative law in algebra? What does it say? When you have, when you have a bunch of terms that you are oring together or adding together, what does the associative law say about the addition or the sum of all of those terms? Is it that you can switch the order around? You can switch the order by grouping, by a different nesting structure. So you can put parentheses in any way, as long as all the operators are addition, or in this case, you know, disjunction. It doesn't matter how you put the parentheses. You know, they still you work out to be exactly the same. That's the associative law. So I should have said associative law instead of commutative law. And then moving on to the next line is factoring, because you know, we, can, we can see, oh, x i, y i is here. x i, y i, oh, x i, k i, sorry. x i, k i is here. x i, k i is also here. So I use factoring to extract x i, k i out, and then we use addition for the terms that are not commonly, that are not common between the two products, or the two conjunctions in this case. So this thing here becomes this thing over here. This thing here becomes this thing over here. In other words, it is the reverse of distri distribution. So instead of you know, spraying out the terms, I'm consolidating the terms. And then from here, I have you know yi or not yi. I use another Boolean algebra rule that does not exist in um, algebra, which is x or not x is true. Does that make sense to you? You have a Boolean variable. If, you, if you're oring that with the negation of the same Boolean variable, you always get true because one of them has to be true. If one is true, the other one is false. If one is false, the other one has to be true. So when you look at the disjunction, it has to be true always. But if this is not making sense to you intuitively, you can always use a truth table again just to prove it. All right. So now we are using identity again because you know anything and true is just the anything. So I just basically toss away the one because it is not doing anything useful. So now we have um, factoring again because you can see how ki is common to these two terms. So ki got extracted and then the terms that are different are grouped into its own disjunction. And there we go. Okay, we are, done. We are now done with the entire derivation. Once again, in this class, I am not going to expect you guys to do Boolean algebra, okay? So the derivation itself is not important in this class. It is important in my CISP 440, but not in CISP 310. So you might ask, but, but then why do you put it here? It's using up space. Well, I put it up here because I, I needed to convince myself that I know how to derive to the end result because I cannot just teach something because somebody else claims blah, blah, blah equals to blah, blah, blah. I have to actually be able to do the derivation, but since I'm doing the derivation on the side, I might as well put it into the teaching material just in case someone finds it useful as well. Okay, <clears throat> so what is the big deal here? It doesn't seem to solve the problem of K of I plus one depending on K of I. 
because in the original form, k of i plus 1 definitely depends on k of i. But after all the derivation, you can see k of i plus 1 still depends on k of i. Hmm, that doesn't seem to solve any problem with all of these steps in between. However, now we can define your two terms. One is g of i and one is p of i. G of i is, okay, let me scroll this up so the people in the back can see it more clearly. So we can define g of i just to be the conjunction of xi and yi, and then p of i as the disjunction of xi, yi. Very simple, right? You have g and p are you know, easy terms being defined. One is the conjunction, and then the other one is the disjunction of the respective bits of x and y. But using this, I can now take a look at this and go like, hey, this is just g of i and this is just p of i. So I can now re-express k of i plus 1 to g of i plus or, or p of i k of i. Are we still doing OK so far up to the point where the mouse pointer is located? You good? Question? Nope. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm, I'm starting to see how the, how the, the, the look ahead works. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to see. Yeah, but we are getting there. Okay, we're getting there. We, oh, you're looking ahead of. You're actually looking ahead in the look ahead mechanism. Yeah. Um, Very I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm like seeing. Okay, so we're, we we got the ki. So we're right. We're getting the ki plus one. So it's. Yep. Ahead. Yep. Well, not yet. Okay, this is not quite there yet. You know, but the next trick is going to do it. Because right now, we still have k of i plus 1 depending on your know, k of i. The g of i and p of i are not a problem, right? Because g of i are, and g of p of i and g of i are very easy to compute. One is simply the and between the x and the y bits. The other one is simply the or between the x and the y bits. That is why your previous lab is using a multi-bit gate. Because using one single multi-bit gate, you can now compute all the g terms using one single gate. And you can compute all the p terms using another multi-bit gate, because they are really just taking all of the x bits, taking all the y bits, do a multi-bit and, you get all the g's. And you, if you do a multi-bit or, you get all the p's. That's easy, right? Well, but k of i is still a problem, because we still have k of i plus 1 equals to g of i plus p of i and k of i. So we still have not removed the dependency. So like, OK, well, let's, let's just see what happens now if I just say, you know, what if i equals to 0? If i equals to 0, we get this, right? Because if k of i plus 1 becomes k of 1, and then g of i becomes g of 0, p of i becomes p of 0, k of i becomes k of 0. So this one is like, OK, so what about this? OK, there's nothing mysterious about this one. Because k0 is an input. Um, and then g of 0 depends only on x and the y bits. So they are, you know, it's easy to compute. p of 0 is also to compute. So that's not a problem. What about the next one? What if i equals to 1? <clears throat> if i equals to 1, then we are trying to compute k of 2, because the equation here is is telling us how to compute k of i plus 1. So if i equals to 1, we're trying to compute k of 2. So k of 2, once we expand you know, this one, you know, or substitute, I should say, once we substitute i equals to 1, we end up with this. You go like, haha, we are, we are not getting rid of k, k of 1. k of 2 still depends on k of 1. But we know what k of 1 is now, don't we? Because we know k of 1 is g of 0 or p of 0 and k of 0. So we now make that substitution. Because now k of 1 is now you know, substituted with g of 0 or p of 0 and k of 0. And therefore, k of 0 is k of 1. Sorry, k of 1 is now gone. If you look at just the second row of this derivation, there is no k of 1 anymore. But we use distribution one more time. So we end up with g of 1 or p of 1 and g of 0 or p of 1, p of 0 and k of 0. Are there any questions? This is the magic. We got rid of k of 1 in the equation that we need to compute k of 2. That is the magic right there. It's called substitution. Now, you, you can do this one more step, right? You can look at k of 3 and say, OK, so what about k of 3? k of 3 is easy. 
well, easy and a little bit messy at the same time, because now we look at K of three, K of three is G of two or P of two, K of two. We got this from this generalized you know, template here. But since all, we already know what, of K, what is K of two, we now substitute the entire expression for K of two in place of K of two. And then we do distribution one more time, and then we end up with G of two or P of two and G of one, or P of two, P of one, and G of zero, or P of two, P of one, P of zero, and K of zero. Yes? So, um, wouldn't this get messy like very tiny, just like K of 10 or K of 11? You, 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 write, a, you write a program to do it. Oh. <laughs> yes? So with a K, with a three by three adder, you need k of zero, which is an input, so that's not a problem. K of one, which is already you know here, because that's just a straight substitution of k equals to zero. K of two, which is derived here. K of three, which is also derived here. So like more density derived more. Correct. So the general form, because somebody is going to ask this question, I want to look at what is k of sixty four. I'm making a sixty four bit adder. And I want to know what is K of 64. That has got to be pretty messy, right? So the answer to that question is, yeah, we can use this. Okay. Of course, you know, most people have not seen the big V or the big OR notation or the big WET or the big AND notation. And that's why you know, I also added a little bit more to the notes you know, over the weekend. Actually, it was just last night or this morning. I cannot remember which one. All right, so if you just look at the big AND here of I equals to A to B, P of I, and P of I is what we call a predicate, you can look at the predicate as a function that returns a Boolean type. So it returns either one or zero, okay? Given that I, it's going to do some computation and returns either a uh, one or zero. So this term here, this expression, is basically the same thing as what this big AND is doing. So... Let me give you a quick explanation of the, what the big AND is doing here. First of all, this is called a pointer to a function. <coughs> Many of you probably did not learn this from CISP 360, because I think in CISP 360, most professors barely have enough time to go over pointers, let alone pointers to a function. But that is what it is, okay? It is a pointer to a function, which allows you to pass a function as an argument to another function. And it makes it kind of flexible, right? Because you know, all this is now saying is, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what the Boolean function is. Somebody else will specify when big AND is invoked or big, when big AND is called. So without even knowing what the predicate function is, which I only know as, oh, it's appointed to some other function somewhere else, I can now perform the calculation the result is initialized to be true, and then we have an index variable i, just like using i over here. i starts with a, just like over here. It ends with b inclusively. So that's why when i is equaling to b, we have one last iteration to perform. And then after each iteration, I have a post increment so that we increment, we bump i up by one for each iteration. The most important part here is we are simply ending all the P of I's. So we start off with P of A, P of A plus one, P of A plus two, and, 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 all the way up to and including P of B. So that gigantic you know, conjunction is then returned as the result of this big end here. Same thing with big OR with two differences. The first one is big OR has result initialized to be zero. And instead of ANDing with all the P of I, it is ORed with all the P of I's. So basically the big OR, as the name implies, is basically the OR of P of A, P of A plus one, P of A plus two, P of A plus three, blah, 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 all the way to P of B inclusively. Are we doing okay so far with the mm -hmm. notation? the big N notation and the big OR notation. It's just like the sigma notation, except we are not adding, we are ANDing, and we are ORing 
but it's basically the same idea as the sigma notation. Yes. So with the big end, we start off as a default of true. And the first chance, you know, you have something that returns a false, it becomes false, and there's no way to turn it back into true again. And then the other one is exactly the opposite. We start with a false. If any one of the P of I terms is true, then the whole thing is going to be true. And there's no way to turn it back into false once it is true. Because it's just a big OR. It's really just the OR of P of A, P of A plus 1, all the way down to P of B. All right. So now that we have explained what is the big N, what is the big OR, this is really just a nested. I mean, it looks messy, but it's not really that bad, okay? Because you can just look at this as a double loop, right? The first loop or the outer loop uses I as an index. It goes from I go from 0 to N. The inner loop, which is here, starts with a different index variable, which is J. J starts with I plus 1, and it goes all the way up to N. And then we, we basically perform a conjunction with all the P of J's inside here, and then that as a big conjunction, it's also ended with G of I. And then that whole thing becomes you know, just you know, what we, we would call P of I, you know, which is this part here. And then this entire conjunction, this entire disjunction, is also ORed with this term over here, which is K of 0 and the big end of all the P of I's. So are we good so far? So one thing I would recommend you guys to do is to look at this, substitute this n with 2, and then see if you can come up with what we ended up as k of 3. Because if this is all supposed to work out the way they're supposed to work out, you should get k of 2, I mean, excuse me, k of 3 like this, from the generator like this. So that, uh, that middle one, the one with the PJ, mm -hmm. how's that one going? Is it, uh, so is it ending all the, is it ending GI with all the PJs or what So you compute just the, this term first. Yeah. So, so you get the conjunction of all the P's. Yeah. And then you end the GFI with that. Gotcha. Because this is an implicit, what we see as a multiplication. But in Boolean expression, the multiplication is a conjunction. Okay, so it's and it, it, that one's oring. Sorry, that's ending all of the xi's plus yi's, or like x or y's. So it's all ending all the p's of all the i's or something. No way. Let me see if I can uh, answer that question with. Uh, Okay, I'm going to work this one out for you guys just so that you can see, you know how. <laughs> yes, I know it's. I mean, if you look online, you know, look up um, uh, carry look ahead equations. I actually came up with this notation. Um, I did not wrote, copy it from anywhere else. I just kind of go like, "Hey, this is really messy," but I can I think I can see the pattern. So once I see the pattern, I can turn it into something that is much more generalized. And do you do you think that skill is going to be useful for all of you? You know, as a developer, as a programmer, as a software engineer, as a computer scientist, to be able to look at patterns. If I give you K1, K2, and K3, and I ask you, you know, what is K of n going to look like, or what is K n plus one going to look like? It is very important. This is a skill that makes you a good employee. Sorry, I was not looking at the previous. Oh, okay. Right. So let me see if I can do this. Um, I am going to. Okay, I'm going to use a tool. I still haven't programmed the uh, the screenshot tool for. Okay, so I'm going to take a screenshot of this thing here. And I put it into my whiteboard tool. So copy to the clipboard. Sure. Let's see if that works. All right. So I want you guys to look at this and see if I can paste it there somewhere. Okay. Paste. Yes. 
That works. It actually works. What are the chances, right? <laughs> All right. So now we're going to say n equals to 2, right? Because if we want to figure out what is k of 3, so when n equals to 2, then we're trying to figure out a, k of n plus 1, which is 2 plus 1, which is 3. So on the other side, we have i going from 0, i equals to 1, i equals to 2. And when i equals to 0, then we have g of 0. In this one, we have g of 1, and then we have g of 2. And then the big N notation for j, this one is going to have j going from 1 to 2. And then in this case, j is going to go from 2 to 2. And in this case, j is going to be going from 3 to 2, which means there's no loop. Okay, wait, hold on a second here, okay? Yeah, because you guys should be screaming right now and go like, what? What are you talking about? When i equals to 2, this thing has no iteration whatsoever. Why? Because what is the C code saying? The C code says um, j you know, starts with i plus 1, which is 3 to begin with, because i equals to 2 in this case, right? So 2 plus 1 is a 3. So why do I say there's no iteration whatsoever? Because n is 2, because it's overbound, and also it has to do with the loop having a control structure or the logic of the loop looking like this. Give me a second to move my mouse pointer here. It has to do with the, 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 the loop here is asking, you know, is i less than or equal to or equal to b, but b is 2 in this case, right? i is initialized to 3 to begin with, is 3 less than or equal to 2? The answer is no. So we don't even perform a single iteration, which means it simply returns whatever the default value is, which is true. Okay? So all of this stuff here, I hope, should be making some sense. Okay? If it's not making sense right now, you know, please review the materials so that it starts to make sense to you. All right. So if j equals to 1, then we have p of 1. And with, when, with j equals to 2, we have p of 2. This one has just p of 2. This one has true by itself because that's the initialization value for the function. Okay, so now we look at these two. Okay, we look at these two, and it becomes a conjunction of p to p1. And then we look at this one here, it becomes a p of 2. We look at this one here, it is just simply as true. All right, so now we look at g of 0. So g of 0, okay, let me use a different color. So g of 0 is ended with p2, p1. g of 1 is ended with p2. g of 2 is ended with 1, which is like, okay, we are not doing anything to it. So now let me just kind of give you what this side is going to generate. So we have g of 0, p of 2, p of 1, um, or g of 1, p of 2, or g of 2. And now we want to work out the other side. So the other side has the other side has i going from 0 to n. n is 2, by the way. So once again, we end up with um, i equals to 0, i equals to 1, i equals to 2. So in this case, it's easy, because all we are doing here is to refer to p of i. So now we have p of 0, p of 1, p of 2. So we have p of 0, p of 1, p of 2, and those are all ended together. So let me use a different color, let's say blue. So these three are ended together to become p of 0, p of 1, p of 2, but in the end they also have to be ended with the k of 0 over here. So now we have this term, oops, wrong color. Let me change it back to this color here. So now we have this term becoming um, k of 0 and p of 0, p of 1, p of 2, like so. And, they, and these two, okay, this term and this term here, they're ORed together. Okay, so I'm going to put a big OR here. So you can either use a plus, you know, as an OR, or if you don't like that, you can use the usual OR symbol. So now the question is, are we getting back to whatever 
k of 3 was you know, based on my substitution you know, derivation. Let's take a look. So we go back to this slide here. And we look at k of 3. We have g of 2 by itself. OK, do we have g of 2 by itself over here? So we do have g of 2 all by itself. g of 1 is ended with p of 2 alone by itself. So let's see if that is the case. Yep, so we have g of 1 ended with p of 2. g of 0 is ended with p2, p1. G of, p, g of 0 is ended with p1, p2. Yep, we got it so far. And we only got one last term, which is k of 0, is ended with all of the p terms. So when we switch back here, we can see k of 0 is ended with all the p terms. In other words, the generator function at least worked fine with k of 3. Are we doing OK so far? All right. Let me switch back to the note here. In today's lab, you are going to be asked to implement the gate logic for K1, K2, and also K3. And you can see that K3 has three lines of expansion. Which line do you think you're supposed to use? Even if you know nothing about carry log ahead and stuff like that, which line do you think is the most important line in the derivation? Yes. Yeah. Always going to be the last one, right? OK, but every single year, every single semester, Somebody decided to use the first line as the line to use when we want to implement the carry look ahead adder, how to compute all the k bits. So that is not the case, okay? Use the last line. All right, so the idea of a carry look ahead mechanism is no matter which k we try to compute, it's going to take constant time. You go like, I don't see how it can be constant time. Look at how K3 is more complex than K2. How can they be using constant time? Well, they can be using constant time because, so I'm going to do that trick again. Let me, because it's cool, so I'm going to do it again. So we'll go to, I really need to program my hotkey so I can do a screenshot without having to actually run the code, but I'm just going to extract these two. Okay, and then switch to Zerno on your side, and then on my side, I can use the pen to insert the stuff. All right, so let's see, paste, and move it down here. Okay, that's good. All right, so I am going to switch to a highlighter pen. So I'm going to look at this and go like, OK, how do we implement something like this? I'm actually doing your lab right now. Um, can, can someone tell me what I need to do? Uh, let me circle what I'm talking about first, and then we'll go ahead and try to do that. OK, so we're, I'm looking at this part here. So the question is, how do I do this in Logisim? Well, first of all, what do I need to do first, right? So we need conjunction, another conjunction, right? So after I have these two conjunctions, you know, having its own output, then g of 1 is going to be ORed with the output of those two conjunctions. Does that make sense? Okay. So that means, in terms of the gate logic, it might look something like this. Okay. This is <clears throat> the problem of getting old is, you know, when I can, when I take this off, I can see stuff that are far, and I can't see anything that's close. When I put this on, I can see stuff that is close, but not far because your lens is not flexible anymore, so the autofocus mechanism of your eye doesn't work quite as well as it used to be anymore. Do you have bifocals, or is that like just a separate design? I have bifocal, but the problem with the bifocal is I have to look like this. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yep. 
it doesn't help that much. So my new glasses, you know, which I'm going to pick up soon, is going to be you know just single focal. All right, it's time to take roll. So we'll go. We'll get back to this as soon as we are done taking roll today. So you might want to use a mobile device or the computer in front of you to get ready for roll taking. All right, so I got it all ready today. It's road taking activity for September 6th. And the proper answer is look ahead. Wow, very imaginative. And then we go back to detail. I'll give you guys some time to do it. I'll give you until like 10 a.m. to do it. So plenty of time, but it's just that you have to remember to do it. There we go. Save and publish. So now you should be able to see it and participate. So while you guys are doing it, I am going back to Zernal and you just draw something here. So go ahead and do the role taking activity and I am going to draw some stuff here. Now it appears after a few seconds. So how do you like Zerno? Is it working out with for you guys? It's better than me using the whiteboard because now you don't have to come up here to take a you know, picture of the, uh, of the whiteboard. This is all getting recorded. As long as I remember to uh, stream it, it's all getting recorded. <laughs> Occasionally, I do forget to click the button. So it's good to uh, ask me to double check. You know, are we streaming? Yes, we are. All right, looks like we are all done. Does anyone need more time for the road taking activity? Okay, all right. Is, uh, zero, right? K zero is an input pin, so it may be zero, it may not be zero. It's just an input. Oh, so it's yeah. So K zero is an input, so we can daisy chain these adders. Because now you can say, oh, we have a three by three adder. What is the quickest way to make a six by six adder? Daisy chain. Yep. All right. Are we good with the road taking activity? No? Yep. Uh, I just have a question of logism. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I make these? Like, it's just escape? Or, mm -hmm. Like, if I have something here, I just don't want to like, put it anymore? Uh, just... You just switch to some other thing, you know, or you can just put it back into the pointer tool. Or are we making this a logistic right now? Mm, well, I would not recommend it because you know this would distract you from listening to what I have to say, which I think is more important than the procedural stuff you know, to you know just to try to get it into logistic. All right. So are you okay? I mean, 
You did. Okay, excellent. All right, so getting back to uh, our discussion here, this is what it looks. It's going to look like. This expression here is going to look like this circuit in logic sim. And for whatever strange reason, there is a long lag between the update on my side and the actual update on the other side. I have no idea why, but there's just a long update delay like that. Okay, so, um, but the bottom line is G1 is all by itself. It doesn't, it goes straight to the OR gate. P1 G0 is ended with a little AND gate here. The output of that AND gate feeds into the OR. And then P1, P0, K0 would be the three inputs into this AND gate. And then the output of this AND gate also becomes one of the inputs into the OR gate. Is that okay? Does everybody see that? Yep. And just to confirm, there's three inputs into that one OR gate, right? Say that one more time. There's three inputs into that one OR gate? Yep. Okay. That is correct. So you have two AND gates, one AND gate has two inputs, one AND gate having three inputs, and then you have one single OR gate that has three inputs. So I'm not gonna label which pin is which pin because I think it should be fairly evident by itself you know, from the expression, which one is which one, because when you look at this, it's, it just looks like that. So the other one is gonna be more complex, but it's, it's gonna have the same shape, right? Except it has three AND gates one with two input pins, one with three input pins, one with four input pins. But all of those AND gates, and also G2 by itself, would feed into a single OR gate as well. So why do you think I said, you know, it would take the same amount of time? But obviously it's more complex, but why is it going to take the same amount of time to compute? Because the amount of time for each AND gate to go from the input to the output is the same regardless of how many inputs it has. So these two AND gates are working concurrently. They're working at the same time. So by the time you know, this one has an output, this one has an output too. So as a result, the OR gate can now happen. So what if there are five of these AND gates because we're trying to compute a K of six? Doesn't matter. Those five AND gates, they all work concurrently, so they will come up with an answer also at the same time. So the OR gate, which now has six inputs, can start the computation, you know, with the same delay. And as a result, you know, it only takes the same amount of time, no matter which K you're trying to compute using this mechanism. This is the whole idea of carry look ahead. That's why the, 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 the AND gates aren't connected to each other. They're Correct. connected to the OR one. Right. They're not waiting for the one AND gate to finish so that the, one can, the other one can do its business right. so that they can finally go into the OR gate so that that can do the final thing. Yep, exactly. Now, you, the other way to look at this is to look at this from the reverse perspective, right? Because eventually, we want to know what is the output of the OR because that's our K bit, that's our carry bit. So we look at this and go like, okay, you know, in order for this OR gate to compute the right result, it needs three inputs. It needs all three inputs to be correct. The first one goes to this AND gate here, so it has to wait for this AND gate to be done. But at the same time, it's also waiting for the second AND gate. And also at the same time, it's waiting for the third input, which is not even coming from an AND gate. So if these two AND gates can get things done at the same time with the same delay, then we are only looking at one propagational delay. The term propagational delay refers to how much time it takes for a change of the input pin of a device to the proper output, cha output change of the same device. That is called a propagational delay, okay? So we are assuming that all the gates have the same propagational delay. So we have one propagational delay from here to here, but that's the same propagational from de delay from here to here. This one has no propagational delay. And then we have another propagational delay for the OR gate. So with two propagational delay, we get the result done, regardless of which carry bit we are talking about. Now, K64 obviously is going to look really ugly, right? Because it's going to have 63 of these AND gates, and they range from two inputs all the way up to 63 inputs. <laughs> and now you have all these 64 individual wires 
going into a gigantic OR gate. But when you look at, at the number of levels of gates, we're still looking at two levels, even though the first level has many, many, many gates, but they are all computing at the same time. Concurrency is the, the name of the game. So are we doing okay so far with the concept of why carry look ahead is it works well? Yep. Mm -hmm. Wait, is it because you said all of those gates are concurrent? Mm -hmm. You said like that time constancy or whatever you said. Propagation of delay. Yeah. No, no, like earlier you said like something about time. Mm -hmm. Like is that why it said the same time or whatever you said like earlier? So it takes a little bit of time in order for a gate to get its work done. Yeah. So from here, from any changes to the input pin to the output pin changing to the correct answer based on the input pin, mm -hmm. it takes a little bit of time. We are, we are talking about um, nanoseconds here, okay? It's a very short amount of time, but nonetheless, there is amount of time. Okay. So there's a propagation of delay from here to here, but it's going to be the same as the propagation of delay from here to here. So these two, because they are parallel, they can get their things done concurrently. So it doesn't add extra time because they're, they're not in sequence. So when these two are done, then this guy can go because this has always been ready anyway. So when this guy goes, it's also taking the same propagation of delay from the time when the inputs are changed to the output reflecting the correct answer. There's always an answer at the output. It's just a matter of, is it the right answer? Yep. Just to follow up, like a mm -hmm. future gate like that's more complex than an AND gate, the time propagation should be like a little bit like more than the other gate. We are assuming context. it is the same, you know, regardless of the number of inputs. Okay. Yep. All right. So are we doing okay so far with the concept of a carry look ahead adder? All right. Cool. <clears throat> So with that out of the way, we are now moving on to an exercise. The exercise is basically your lab today. I broke it up into two labs because I found that with one single lab, most people cannot get it done within an hour and a half. So I broke it up into two halves. So the first half only you know, get a part of the lab done, which is why also you, know, you might want to save your file by the end of the first lab because you know, that's going to be your starting point for the second lab on Thursday. Okay, so this is just a little bit of look ahead of, you know, what you need to do on Thursday based on what you're going to do today. So the significance of this module is to illustrate how to implement an arithmetic adder using logic gates. And the first implementation is using the propagational, uh, prop, sequentially propagating the carry bits, and that's why it's called the carry ripple adder because there's a ripple effect you know of you know the carry bit going from bit zero to bit one bit one to bit two and so on and then the second implementation is called a carry look ahead mechanism and it is far more efficient from the time perspective it is not efficient at all from the number of gates perspective because it's it's, it's it actually takes a lot more gates in order to get things done but it is a lot faster so are we doing okay with addition, more or less? All right. So let me give you a map of you know where we are now and and sort of you know the journey that we have taken you know, up to this point. So let me give you new oh new page four intended to be after, but that's okay. So the first thing we did was the 2P, 2N, you know, thing, and that gave us transistors, right? You know, we went from transistors to the basic, you know, NAND 2 gate. NAND 2, the 2 refers to how many inputs we have. So we have, you know, one input NANDed with the second input. So then we took the AND, we say, hey, we can use this to implement NOT, we can use this to implement OR, we can also use it to implement AND, and I'm definitely using the alternative notations here. So we have NOT, OR, AND, and then we kind of change the subject to base conversion. So base conversion talked about, oh, you know, we're dealing with values, but each value can be represented in any base you want. 
Okay, yeah, we use base 10 simply because we have 10 fingers, okay, which is a very arbitrary kind of number, okay. It, base 10 is no better than base 7 or base 5 or base 4 or base 2 and so on. So after that, we talk specifically about base 2. So base conversion has two things in it. So given a value, what is the number? And also given a number, what is the value being represented? So we worked on these two, you know, in opposite direction. There are equations and formulae, you know, to get this done. So that's you know, the discussion of, you know, well, we have a value, how do we, we represent things in base two? So after that, we got into addition. When we talked about addition, the first thing we did, the first thing I did was to say, eh, let's go back and re review you know, how to perform addition in base 10. But I also named the individual digits, right? So I named the digits you know, with the columns. So we have the X, Y, Q, K, S uh, rows, and then we just number the columns you know, based on the position of the digit, which is digit zero, digit one, digit two, and so on. And then we established the structure. So the next thing we did, was we established a structure of, uh, of addition, and that's still applicable to base 10. And that's when we came up with the R function. The R function is simply computing the single digit sum between two digits. So in base 10, six plus seven has a single digit sum of three. It has a carry of one. So we also have a carry function. So both of those were defined in a sense that they will work with any base. The code that I gave you in the notes worked in base 10, okay, because I used mod 10 and also comparison of 10 in order to get these two functions done. But once we have these two, you know, uh, written in base 10, then we go to base 2, because, you know, to change the base 2, all we needed to do is to look at all the constant of 10s within these two functions and say, eh, we'll change those to two, and now we have R and C for base two. It doesn't change the structure of how Q relates to X and Y. It doesn't change the structure of how S relates to Q and K. It also doesn't change the structure of how K is computed by the C function applied to X, Y, and Q, K of the previous column. So that structure is still the same. Except you know the way we compute Q, uh, excuse me, the way we compute R and S are different. Okay, so in base two, R and C can be done in uh, logical dot, logical and, and also logical or, because it's a special case. We look at the truth table and we figure out, hey, carry is really just a conjunction. Okay, that's the easier one. And we look at the R function and go like, well, that looks a little bit more complicated, but we can call it exclusive OR, but we can also you know, use a slightly more complex expression, but nonetheless get it done using Boolean operators. Okay? And once we got to that point, that was all last week, by the way, then we moved on and talked about um, carry ripple adder. You know, that only works in base two, because in base two, we can now convert everything to logic gate operations. So, so that's when we talked about carry ripple adder. I gave you guys the file, okay? So you guys already have the logism file for carry ripple adder. And anyone who's gonna turn in that file in place of the carry look ahead you know, circuit that is due on Thursday will not only get a zero, but will also get a negative score. Because, because that's what that person deserves. <laughs> because a zero means I don't really quite understand, but you know, turning in a carry ripple adder circuit for a carry look ahead you know, adder, it's like, wow. That's like totally not understanding the concept whatsoever. Um, anyway, I'm not gonna give people negative scores because just because Canvas won't let me. <laughs> so, so that's what we did last week, okay? Last Thursday, I gave you guys the carry ripple adder because we can now perform addition in base two using only logic gates and we can implement the entire thing in logic sim. What we did today is to look at the carry ripple adder and we say, 
That's awfully inefficient. Okay, you know, it has linear dependency between all the carry bits. We don't like it. Okay, we want things to be done fast. So that's how we convert that into a carry look ahead adder today. And that is done by a few tricks. Okay, you know, and I'm really hoping that at least some people read the notes ahead of time because it is super important in this class. So the, the tricks that we did was the first one is to take this form and convert it into this form here by isolating k of i plus 1 into xi, yi by itself, and then something also involving xi, and y, xi, yi, but it's ended with k of i. And then we define g of i and p of i. It became k of i plus 1, looking like this. It's a template. And then we plug in i equals to 0. We get this. And then we say, OK, what about i equals to 1? We get this. But then we use substitution. We end up with this form here. And then we ask, what do we do? What do we get when i equals to 2? That becomes k3 and becomes like this. And then we realize that this can now be done using three AND gates, because this is one AND gate, this is one AND gate, this is one AND gate. The output of the three AND gates combined with g2 by itself would go into a single OR gate. And then we can now compute k of 3. But it still involves only two propagational delay, because given the p and the g terms already computed, we only need one propagational delay for all of the ands, and then another propagational delay for the final or. So that's why we can say, oh, so with using this form, k1, k2, and k3 will take the same amount of time to compute. Okay, but based on the pattern that we saw here, we look at k2, we look at k3, then I asked myself. What is k4 going to look like? What about k5? What about k of n plus 1 in general? So I came up with this close, well, more or less close form here using the big or and the big and notation. And you know, here is really just an explanation of those things using code that you for more, more or less understand in C and C++. And by the way, every time I say C code, it is implicitly C++ code. Why? Yep. C++ is, for the most part, a superset of C. In other words, everything in C is in C++. So if you claim that you know C++, it implies that you also know C at the same time. I didn't know that. Oh, OK. Well, I'm curious why the professor in CISP 360 did not explain that, because that's kind of like a I wouldn't say super important, but it is really a historical thing that has significance when it comes down to you know how C++ um, came into existence. It's basically an extension of C. I met, yeah, go ahead. Maybe she said, uh, maybe I just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> you can go back to uh, the recording if there's any. No. <laughs> Long time ago. So I actually met, uh, this is a digression, I actually met the guy who invented C++, and many people asked him, you know, so how come you did not fix some of the problems in C and you just kind of move everything over to C++, including some of the really dangerous concepts like point arithmetic and you know, general dereferencing and all kinds of weird stuff like that. And the guy said, you know, if I make C++ not backward compatible to C, then no one is going to use it. And the whole idea was to provide a gentle path, a gentle slope for people to transition from regular C programs to C++ object-oriented programming. So that was his answer. I actually met the guy like in the same room. He was the presenter. Cool. Yeah, that was kind of cool. Well, C Sharp is a Microsoft thing, which Microsoft had done many, many times already. So they take a very well-established industry standard, and then they poison it and call it their own. <laughs> That's typically how they get things done. <clears throat> right, so say, uh, C Sharp probably did that to Java. Um, I cannot remember which other language you know, Microsoft kind of you know, poisoned and turned into their own clinical language. But there was one prior to C. C sharp, and I think the term C sharp came from a, a manager uh, misreading the plus plus. Somebody wrote the plus plus, kind of overlapping, so it becomes a sharp. I don't know. I just uh, I was I, I knew C sharp, and then I did a Java programming course, and I was just like, wait a minute, this is just. So the, if the two pluses overlap a little bit, it looks like a sharp symbol. 
So I, I, I think that might be one of the origins why it's called C-sharp in, in Microsoft. But C-sharp is just D-flat. Music theory. Oh, D-flat is just going to be a... <laughs> <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't have the same ring to it, though. Like, like yeah, I put it in D-flat. It's like putting Delphi. It doesn't, it doesn't have that. I code in Python and Swift. Swift. And Coplin. HTML. HTML is okay. Markdown is even better. Yeah. All right. So there is that. All right. So are we do okay so far with all of this stuff here? Because I do want to get back to this one here to give you a map of how we got here, because I want you guys to be able to take a view of the forest itself to see how we got here. So the bottom line is we once we get here, now we can implement adders, which can add values in transistors. OK, now that's a big thing. OK, I think that's a really big thing. So we got about eh, about six minutes or so, you know, so we can get into subtraction. OK. So let's go into subtraction, and I'm going to use you know, the zero node here. So when we get into subtraction, um, the first thing I want to do is to kind of <clears throat> make a new page, this time after. There we go. So I want to show you, you know, what a multi-digit subtraction looks like in base 10, right? Because, you know, that's what we do, you know, is to go from base 10, things that we're familiar with, and then we extract the pattern, we extract the structure, and then we specialize the structure into base 2, which is what we want to end up with. So we'll go ahead and give you um, 102 minus, I don't know, let's try a... 600 and let's see that's going to be a 9 695 yeah that's mm, nope okay i changed my mind forget about the 9 this is another zero here there we go all right so this is all in base 10. We should be able to, or should, we should feel comfortable doing this. Once again, we have X, Y, Q, okay? So these three are the same. This one I call it T, and then at the last one here we call it D for difference. So only the last two rows got changed a little bit, and I don't like my lines not lining up, so I'm gonna redraw this line so it lines up a little bit better like that, okay. So now Q is going to be the single digit difference between X and Y. What is going to be 2 minus 5? What is the single digit difference of 2 minus 5? No. Oh, it's uh, 0. OK, so what you do is you look at 2, and then you say, OK, what do we do when we need to subtract 5 from 2? You go like, no, that doesn't work, right? Go ahead. This is 102 minus 605. So it's going to be a negative number? It's going to be negative. Well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, but the single digit difference between 2 and 5 is like, okay, what happens when I remove 5 from 2? You go like, if you ask a kid like you know, that question, the kid will go like, it doesn't make sense. Okay, 2 is less than 5. You cannot take 5 from 2. And then you go like, okay, but I do allow you to borrow. Okay, so when you borrow from the next digit, you're borrowing a 10, right? So suddenly your 2 becomes a 12. 12 minus 5 is 7. Very good. So, so the single digit difference between 2 and 5 turns out to be 7. So single digit difference between 0 and 0 is just 0. 1 minus 6 has a single digit difference of well, 1 is less than 6, so we cannot do the subtraction unless we borrow, right? But whenever we borrow, we borrow a 10 because this is in base 10. This is base 10 subtraction. So now we end up with 11 minus 6, which is 5. Very good. Okay. 
So you might ask, why do you keep calling this Q? Because obviously this R function works differently for subtraction. We'll get to that, okay? So now we look at the T row, which is the borrow, okay? So there's no borrow here as the first digit. What about digit one? What about this place over here? Do we have a borrow from the prior column? Yes, uh, would that be a one? Yep, so we have a borrow of one. So the borrow of one is because of this. So now we end up with a borrow of one. And so now we perform seven minus zero. Seven minus zero is just your know, seven. So now when we need to figure out this borrow bit here, do we have a borrow? Well, okay, x plus y does not have a borrow. However, q minus t does end up with a borrow because we have a zero minus one here. So what is the single digit difference of zero and one? No. No, wait, sorry, nine. In base 10. <laughs> you, you would have been right in base 2, but since we're dealing with base 10, 0 minus 1 has a single digit difference of 9. Okay? So we put a 9 over here, and then we put a 1 here. And let me emphasize why we have a borrow of 1. It has to do with that. All right? So now we have 5 minus 1. Yeah, that's okay. That one is pretty easy. We have a 4 over here. What about this place over here? Do we have a borrow? Yeah, because the 6 minus 1. That, that yep. So we do have a 1 here, and that has to do with 1 minus 6. That ends up with a borrow over here. So remember, I, I always want my subtraction to end up with the same number of digits as the number of digits in X and Y. So this is my final answer. You guys go like, but tech, this has to be wrong. Because you know, 102 is less than 605, so how can their difference be 497? But you're forgetting that we have an extra borrow here. What is that borrow? What is the magnitude of that borrow? Well, this would have been a borrow of 1, borrow of 10, a borrow of 100. This is going to be a borrow of... A borrow of 1,000. So now we say with a borrow of 1,000. So you can look at borrow as debt. Okay? So if this is the net worth of somebody, somebody says, hey, I got 497 bucks in my pocket. You go like, wait, but you have a loan about 1,000. So your net worth is actually negative. Is that okay? So that is how we look at this subtraction here. Um, if you look, go to, okay, let me, we are close to the end of the lecture time, but I do want you to, you guys to read ahead of me. So I'm going to show you what note you should be looking ahead into. Once again, looking ahead, right? So now we are into binary uh, subtraction. So binary subtraction has its own topic here, and you know you really should read this before Thursday. So as it turns out, you're know, borrowing. Okay, so it has you know this one starts with all the subtraction stuff. So I'm going to give you guys one more thing to help you understand all that stuff. So if in this case, you know, if you look at Q of I, how do I compute Q of I? If I say Q of I is, once again, R of X, I, Y, I, what do you think R is going to look like? R of you know, A, B, just as names of the arguments, is going to be what? For base 10. Okay, We're only dealing with base 10 here. If I guarantee that A is a single digit in base 10, B is a single digit in base 10, I can now say, hmm. That can go negative, right? Because A can be 0 and B can be 9, so now we have negative 9. And we don't want anything that's negative because you know, the single digit difference is supposed to be non-negative. supposed to be non-negative. So now we say, yeah, we can do that. Just add 10 to this whole thing. And then you go like, but that's not going to work all the time because, you know, uh, what if A is 9 and B is 0? Then we have 9 plus 10, which is 19. Oh, that's easy. Just so mod 10 after the whole thing, then you always end up with a single digit. So that's the new R for subtraction. 
What about the borrow? Okay, so if we have A minus B as single digits, how do we compute borrow itself? Remember what carry looks like? A plus B is greater than or equal to 10, which is the base. So what do we do this time? This one is actually easier. This one is just saying if A is less than B, return a 1, otherwise return a 0. Is that okay? That's for base 10, okay? It works well in base 10. Yeah, go ahead. It's just like a reverse of K. Uh, from, the, from like that right. basin, like carry, yep. versus that one. Yeah, exactly. Well, more or less, because you know, in base 10, we, in, in addition, we have uh, A plus B greater than or equal to 10 to tell us whether there's a carry. Mm -hmm. So to tell whether we have a borrow, we have to ask whether A is less than B. So if I were to convert this to base 2, what do I need to do? Okay, just based on this stuff here, okay? This works in base 10. If you change the 10 to what to B, which is whatever base you're dealing with, it will still work. So how do we change this to base 2? I think I just gave you the answer. Change the 10 to a 2 and we're all done, right? What about the structure? What about the structure that we have here? What is D? What do you think D is going to be? So I'm giving you all of this stuff here. D is D of I is R of Q of I, T of I. Oh, okay. So it's, it's still a single digit difference between the Q and the T, just like the sum is a single digit sum between the Q and the K in the case of addition. So the only one that is really tricky is what about T of I plus 1? T of I plus 1 in this case is the borrow of X, I, Y, I, or the borrow of QI, TI. Wait, tech, that looks awfully familiar, right? If, if I change the T to a K and change the D to a C, we got the K bits back. So as it turns out, subtraction has exactly the same structure as addition. We just have to redefine R and you know, instead of using C, we have B, which is borrow. Then we can keep the rest. The rest of the structure turns out to be exactly the same. All right. We are out of time today. You know, we need to transition to the lab. But the main point here is how do we do R and B without using arithmetic operations? Can we change that to just Boolean operations? That becomes the big question. Okay. And the module that you are going to read prior to the lecture on Thursday actually explains that. Okay, so if you if I just give you a look ahead again, <laughs> you will see that oh, all of that stuff here can be converted into binary operations. So B can be done with binary operations. And then someone may ask, how about R? R turns out to be the same as before. That's why it is still called R in base 2, because it's exactly the same as the R for addition. And then we have you know, this whole kind of big mess thing here. And we have this mess here that should look familiar to you, because instead of the T, we had K today. Instead of, um, yeah, that's about it. The T's became the K today, and you know, so it turns out to be almost exactly the same. The G of I is defined a little bit differently. The P of I is defined a little bit by negation, negating X first. But other than that, subtraction turns out to be very similar to addition. So that's why you know, the binary subtraction module is really short. Because you know, it, it's a very easy transition from addition to subtraction. All right, so 